Well, it's a great honor for me to introduce the 40th Taylor Lecture, Professor P.M. Ajayan, who is Anderson Professor of Engineering at Rice University. Before we get started, let me give a little bit of a bit background about uh, Professor Ajayan. Uh, he earned his uh, Bachelor of Technology degree in Metallurgy, I'm so happy to see, from Banaras Hindu University in 1985, and he received his PhD in Materials Science and Engineering from Northwestern uh, in 1989. Uh, he then went on a sojourn of postdoctoral appointments. Uh, first, he went off to NEC Corporation, where he spent the postdoc for three years. Uh, he then spent two years in Paris. Uh, not, uh, not in Paris, in Orsay, uh, at the laboratory, the South State Physics Laboratory. And then after that, uh, after having, I'm sure, mastered French, uh, he then moved to Germany, at, where he was Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. Uh, finally, he was able to find a real job. So he then joined the faculty at Rensselaer Polytechnic University as an assistant professor and was then appointed Henry Brulach Chair of Professor of Engineering in 2007. Uh, unfortunately for RPI, uh, they lost him, uh, and Rice University had successfully recruited him uh, to join them in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Materials Science uh, as the Benjamin and Mary Greenwood Anderson Professor of Engineering in 2007. We, can, we feel sad for the folks at RPI. Professor Ajayan's research interests include synthesis and structure property relations of nanostructures and material science and application of nanomaterials in general. He's one of the pioneers in nanotechnology and specifically the field of carbon nanotubes and was involved in the early work on the topic along with the NEC group in Japan. He has published one book and I have updated his CV. He's now with the 540 journal articles uh, with more than 33,000 citations. Actually, the, the plots that you saw in the earlier lect lectures that go asymptotic, uh, his asymptote is already gone to infinity, I think, so in a couple more years. His H index is now 91. Last year, he, he published, in, and this is for our new faculty, the assistant professors, this is what you have to compete with. Um, Mike, you out there? Yes, there's Mike, good. Uh, 58 papers last year, according to the Web of Knowledge, and uh, last year he received 4,000 citations alone. So his seminal work on nanotubes has resulted in three papers that have been cited 1,000 times. And one of his papers will be cited 2,000 times, I'm sure by this time next year. A giant has received several awards. He is a senior Humboldt Prize winner, 2006 MRS medalist, AAAS Fellow, Scientific American 50 recognition for his discoveries, Burton Award from the Microscopy Society of America, and also the Hatfield Medal for Outstanding Metallurgist in India. They must not have forgotten about you. Uh, the other remarkable accomplishment is he now holds two Guinness Book of World Records. I hope, hopefully you're going to tell us about these because this is exciting. One for creating the smallest brush. I'm not sure what this brush does. Uh, and the other for creating the darkest material. <coughs> It must be pretty dark. So, Dr. Ajayan, we are absolutely thrilled that you're with us today at Penn State, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you, Gary, uh, very much. I'm now floating uh, in air. <coughs> uh, and thank you again, everyone, for inviting me for this uh, honor. It's certainly an honor. Um, it's always good to be back in Penn State uh, for various reasons. Uh, one, we have a lot of collaborations. You know, we, uh, we have a MURI, as uh, Mauricio mentioned, and uh, we, I have many friends here. I have my niece studying here, in fact, with uh, uh, Mauricio, so there's all kinds of reasons for me to come back. <coughs> so 
Uh, thank you again. <coughs> um, what I'm going to do is uh, talk about a lot of different things, uh, what we have done over the last 10 years or so, maybe even more, uh, with a little bit of focus on what we are doing recently. Uh, and as uh, Gary mentioned, I am a metallurgist and I am interested in materials, uh, and this is going to be a material stock, uh, particularly from the point of view of, uh, uh, you know, if you have building blocks that you can create pretty reasonably well these days, how do you put them together to make something that is useful? <coughs> or even if it is not useful, something that is uh, reasonably uh, good in the sense that you can uh, address from a functional point of view. Uh, and that's been very challenging. <clears throat> uh, as I said, you know, creating building blocks is the easiest part, uh, but when, I, I try, when you try to put things together and engineer them together, then you face a lot of uh, real challenges, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I mean, most of the people talk about excitement in nanotechnology, and obviously that will come through, I hope. Uh, but even beyond that, there is certain challenges that I want to focus on, <coughs> uh, which makes this field even more exciting. <coughs> so if I want to bring nanostructures together, either through self-assembly or to directed assembly or even through a top-down approach, as structures become smaller and smaller, this challenge becomes even bigger. <coughs> uh, so in order to create a structure like this, is actually a self-assembled uh, <coughs> large area a structure made of carbon nanotubes, <coughs> uh, it, it's a challenging feat. And uh, I think the, the, some of the bottlenecks that we face today in trying to translate the excitement of nano science to nanotechnology is because of uh, this issue. Now, I learned, I started doing nanomaterials during my PhD, and it, it goes back quite a uh, few years, as you can see it there. Uh, I was working with uh, Laurie Marks, who is uh, uh, electron microscopist, and we were looking at nanoparticles. And the first impression that I got about nanoparticles was that it's kind of different when we compare it with larger materials, particularly because the structure of the nanoparticles are not really stable, per se. Uh, if you look at a morphological phase diagram of a very small particle, essentially, let's say, for simplicity, take an FCC metal like gold, it keeps changing all the time. You know, depending on what environment it is, depending on what energy it can access. <clears throat> so there is a big difference between a nanoparticle that is essentially floating or without, with very little interaction with the substrate and a nanoparticle that is sitting on a substrate pretty comfortably. Right? So there is an energy balance there, and obviously the substrate stabilizes the particle into particular structure and shape. And that was quite uh, amusing or fascinating to me because you know, normally when you're looking at electron microscopy uh, structures of materials, you have a stable material. And here, things were simply changing. In fact, we even coined a term called quasi-melting. It's not really molten, the material, but the structure is not really stable. Right? So that is one of the uh, things that struck me, and it, even today, uh, you know, it, it stays with me because when you talk about nano, you talk about things that are not very stable. <clears throat> uh, of course, there are some exceptions which I will talk about later. Uh, but uh, uh, when, when we talk about assembling structures into larger materials, uh, there are certain basic challenges. And let me put that up before I actually go into my talk. Uh, one of the big challenges, one of the uh, major challenges in creating large-scale nano architectures is assembly. You know, how, how good is assembly, um, you know, either directed assembly or self-assembly, how good is it to organize large numbers of nanostructures. And as it turns out, it's not that good. Essentially, you end up with a lot of defects. And one has to think about this when we are talking about application. <clears throat> Three-dimensional assembly. Three-dimensional assembly we have not even really thought about much. You know, I think there are not too many ways you can actually do this to build three-dimensional nanoscale architectures using chemistry-based approaches that is typically used in self-assembly. <clears throat> There are a lot of junctions and interfaces, and as dimensions become smaller and smaller, you start getting much larger number of these uh, junctions. How do you controllably build these junctions in order to build up the kind of structure that you want, build up the architectures, and how do you do that scalably? In fact, one of the other muries that Mauricio is part of that we have is essentially addressing this problem. How do you go from building block level to the larger scale structures, but controllably creating interfaces and junctions? And I think it's a, it's a really up in the air <coughs> issue. And then most of the time we talk about a single material. And obviously, that is not good enough. Right? If you're building 
architectures that are functional. Essentially, you have to join and connect and create materials of different compositions. So the question is, how do you really create heterostructures structures at the nanoscale? And how do you build that up into bigger picture? And then there is this whole area of interfaces, <clears throat> particularly when you're talking about bulk materials that are composites and hybrids. You have to figure out how you controllably build these interfaces. And that's been also very challenging. Uh, I'll, I'll mention that towards the end of my talk when we talk about composites. <clears throat> there is another intrinsic challenges, challenge that faces this uh, area in general, according to me. And that is essentially this intrinsic distribution that exists in size or shape or structure uh, which are made by the manufacturing techniques that we are familiar today. Now, the, excitement thing, the exciting thing about nanostructures is that a small change in the uh, structure dimension uh, has a significant impact on the properties of the material. And that's why a lot of physicists are excited about this. But from a manufacturing point of view, this is really a holy grail because there are not too many techniques that allows us to lock in one particular structure and shape that would allow us to access these properties that people are predicting. Right? So intrinsically, for nano manufacturing, you don't have very many techniques that can have the right kind of control that would create exactly the structure that you want. This is an example of a carbon nanotube material. This is a multi-wall nanotube and single-wall nanotube. And you can see that you know, the, the, the techniques that we use to manufacture them, CBD techniques or even other methods, essentially give you a distribution in, in the sizes. Right? Of course, as you go from multi-wall to single wall, the distribution narrows, but nevertheless, you, you do have that distribution. And this is not very good at all, because what theory tells us and what people have actually shown is that as I go from here to here, I, get, I go from metallic to semiconducting or, or some dramatic change in the behavior. So how do I comprehend this disconnect? I think that is a fundamental question that we all should ask when we're talking about nanotechnology and when we're talking about materials and technologies based on nanomaterials. So that, that has not been addressed really. Now, of course, there are varied approaches to nano uh, manufacturing and nanoscale engineering. Uh, the broadly speaking, the top down and the bottom up approach is what I mean. And these are very, very different uh, in terms of approaches, in terms of what we get. Um, in fact, uh, if you think about it, you know, nature does the best nano engineering that, uh, that you can think about. Uh, in fact, this is a quintessential nano composite that has been built up bottom up, layer by layer deposition. And you know, we don't really appreciate that enough or we don't understand that enough to you know, recreate that in our lab. We cannot build today a nano composite bottom up. Simply that is not feasible from the point of view of efficiency and the scalability point of view. But nature has done this. And, and again, I think we, we, it's a good example to uh, mimic. <clears throat> now let me put up another quote from one of our illustrious uh, professors who uh, you know, got the Nobel Prize the discovery of fullerenes, and he used to say towards, uh, he passed away unfortunately several years ago, he, to, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, looking at nanotubes particularly towards the end of his life, and he had all these dreams, and he basically would say things like, uh, you know, I want to actually make a cable and do something with it, you know, go fishing with it, of course, that was his passion. Uh, but I think the problem is that this has never been accomplished, or not even close, and, and again, that represents the disconnect on what we understand at the na real nanoscale, for example, if I take a single carbon nanotube and look at its properties, obviously, you know, it's got very high modulus and strength and so on. But we have not been able to translate that into a larger structure because of all the issues, interface issues and other that, uh, that are associated with it. So the translation of properties at the single molecular level or single nanostructure level to larger scales is simply a very, very difficult problem. And I think this rightly <coughs> uh, illustrates uh, the, the problem at hand. <clears throat> now, with that kind of a background, let me tell you a few examples, show you some examples that uh, we have managed to do in certain ways and many other groups along the same lines. <clears throat> let me start with the idea of uh, reasonably good organization. Uh, and again, it's extremely difficult to precisely organize these structures because of the length scales that they involve in. But uh, to some extent, we could organize them. Uh, here is an example where we have been able to, or many people have been able to grow carbon nanotubes in an aligned fashion on a substrate using simple thermal CBD process. But again, you know, what you're seeing is sometimes misleading. You know, in this particular picture, the low magnification, you see a very nice uniform film. But if I look at a statistical distribution of the particle size or the diameter size, I am seeing this distribution quite uh, clearly. Right? So what, what this material is, is 
an aggregate of different materials. So the carbon nanotube, again, as we know, as you change diameters and structure and so on, you have different properties. So what I have here, it's a film that consists of an aggregate of nanostructures that has some variability in its properties. <clears throat> of course, we can you know, <clears throat> do the second level of hierarchy in terms of patterning, and, and you know, it might be useful for certain things. And here is an example where we have demonstrated that you could take that array of nanotubes and use a laser beam to pattern this into a particular form and then use it for a particular application, you know, which does not require the kind of precision that you need in the organized structures that I showed you before. So here is uh, a thin uh, kind of a array structure which is used in a convective heat transfer uh, approach to remove heat away from a substrate that is a silicon chip. So, and it works pretty well. It actually works uh, you know, uh, quite well, almost the same effect as a, uh, as a copper block of the same size. And it's also compliant and there are some advantages to it. So although we are not able to really precisely organize them, there are some value added propositions that you can think about uh, in applying nanostructures to applications. <coughs> now, that <coughs> reasonably good arrangement of nanostructures is also very interesting. Uh, from a mechanical point of view, we have done a lot of work, for example, looking at the mechanical behavior of these reasonably aligned structures. Now, they are very compliant material. Obviously, graphite has got a very low compression modulus in the axis uh, uh, along the plane. So if you make a nanotube, they're, not, they're also pretty compliant uh, elastically. So you can, uh, you know, these are some experiments where we have shown that you can compress these to large strains for a large number of cycles, and it is really uh, quite robust. Uh, you know, you don't have much fatigue, although there is some energy absorption because of the viscoelastic nature of that particular aggregate. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, you know, this could be stable, uh, dynamically stable structures that could be of interest. I'll give you a couple of examples of possible applications. One it would be a simple and you know, a very basic idea that could be useful in electrical machinery, which is a brush contact. And most of the brush contacts today are essentially metal carbon composites, and they have problems with oxidation and other issues. So here we are trying to implement a, a pure carbon-based material uh, which could be compliant, conducting, thermally stable. So it's an interesting application. And there's also some companies that are looking at this idea uh, at the micro scale, uh, micro scale bundles, to look at uh, uh, compliant probe cards, you know, instead of the MEMS technology that they use. Uh, in fact, you know, probe card is a very expensive business. It's almost $200,000 a piece because of the um, you know, fabrication involved. So if you could think about, again, implementing some of these simple structures, <coughs> we could uh, really gain some uh, advantage. <coughs> now, Gary was mentioning about this uh, Guinness Book of World Records, so I, I'll certainly show you one. Uh, it was interesting because, um, you know, it's, it's not like <coughs> publishing in Nature or something like that. You, you get widespread recognition, especially from young children and so on. So I was a hero at my home, at least, uh, after this was done. <coughs> because uh, uh, essentially, you know, that what, what you're seeing is that uh, an array of nanotubes that absorbs light quite dramatically. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this is a collaboration between Sean Lin at RPI, who's really uh, an expert in optics. And uh, of course, this was a very involved process because we had to get uh, uh, essentially um, <coughs> uh, a sphere uh, which would look at the uh, overall reflectance through all the angles and all the wavelengths. Uh, so an integrated sphere, uh, and, and basically the bottom line is that the, the total reflectance we measured from this nanotip array was only 0.045%, an order of magnitude lower than what existed before, so obviously that's the reason why the Guinness Book uh, and all that. <coughs> and uh, recently they have also extended this to other wavelengths, so it looks like they're absorbing uh, pretty much over the entire range, all the way from uh, infrared to visible. So interesting, and there might be applications to this. In fact, NIST is already looking at this as a, 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 from a detector point of view. So again, the, even, even though the structure as it stands is not as ordered as we would have liked, uh, you know, it still has the kind of peri uh, uh, you know, the, the periodicity that allows it to absorb light. And uh, if you make it with the right density, then you can get uh, uh, quite high absorption. Now, the real issues come when we are looking at very high-end technologies, where the precision in placement is important. You know, we, we worked uh, with the Interconnect Focus Center for quite a long time, trying to implement carbon nanotubes as an alternative to copper that exists today, <coughs> because copper has its own life, life 
with the decreasing dimensions, obviously, copper is going to go away at some point. Uh, <coughs> not very clear when. But certainly, nanotube presented itself as an interesting material. If I look at an individual nanotube and compare it with copper, essentially, you know, it carries much more color. The current density can be higher. There's very little electromigration. So there are some intrinsic factors that would <coughs> allow <coughs> one to think that something that is covalently bonded like carbon in the fo right form would be an interesting material for interconnect. But of course, as we all know, the issues relate to how we could integrate over this large area and how we could place these structures in the right positions uh, and <coughs> uh, you know, create the right kind of architectures. So uh, the first thing, one thing that we looked at for quite a few years was the simple things like a, a, a very short via. Uh, and the idea was to create a via that would have resistance that is lower than that of copper. And we could never really succeed, even after several years. And I don't think uh, people could do this. First of all, it's a complex process uh, in order to get these bundles of nanotube cable uh, vias to be placed in the right position. It involves several steps. Uh, but also, as you grow these structures, they are not really dense enough. And as you all know, nanotubes are very special because each nanotube when they are metallic, they have only a few conducting channels. So if you want to really compete with the conductivity of copper, you need to have very dense packing of the nanotube arrays in these bundles. And we could do some tricks. For example, you could do some liquid evaporation to compress these into very tight bundles. But still, the density is not high enough to compete with copper. So we basically had to essentially give it up. And the other, possible, and the other problem is this interface issue. You know, even, and we have had you know, notorious cases of contact problems with carbon nanotubes. And when you're trying to essentially pick up nanotube arrays and translate into the right kind of uh, metal carbon contacts, then again, you face severe, you know, a lot of issues. And once again, the bottom line was that we couldn't really get two contacts uh, to be ohmic, uh, to be uh, good enough so that it could be competing with any technologies like copper-based VS. <laughs> So uh, that's where it is. But of course, you know, there are some advantages of carbon nanotube-based structures compared to metallic. For example, you know, they're very flexible, and you could easily uh, integrate them to a flexible structure like a polymer film. And uh, again, we have done a few things with these. Uh, one of the um, experiments that we have done over the years is this gecko feet. Essentially, if you have the right kind of uh, uh, structure of these bundles, then they provide a lot of van der Waals forces that would allow us to make these dry adhesives uh, type of applications. So there are some simple things you could do, but when you come to very, really very uh, sophisticated technologies, these type of uh, transfer technologies works not very well. <coughs> now, one of the other things that we have uh, interest in is trying to create really lo long cables and fibers using these nanostructures. Uh, and that would be very interesting, whether it's for mechanical reasons or whether it is for electrical reasons. Uh, for example, for a long time, several groups have tried to get uh, conductivity in these large uh, carbon nanotube fibers to a point where we can again come close to copper. Uh, and it's only recently that uh, by using doping, uh, using certain elements like I iodine in uh, carbon nanotubes, we have been able to get to uh, at least an order of magnitude lower, uh, higher uh, than copper in terms of uh, resistivity. So it's still not copper, but at least we are close by an order of magnitude. Uh, and the advantage is that, of course, if you look at the specific conductivity values, then it's even better than the, some of the metals. Uh, so I think it, you know, it's not a simple translation of metallic carbon nanotubes giving you very high conductivity when you translate into larger structures. But you have to really play around. And there's a lot of uh, uh, involved science that would allow us ultimately to build these kind of structures. <coughs> now. One of the other things I mentioned about uh, early on was this junctions. And junctions are extremely important. And I'll show you uh, the opportunities and also challenges in creating junctions. Now, this is, essentially, we can use a template approach and use uh, a sequential filling process to create multiple compositions in uh, this nanowire format. Uh, here is an example where we have made these gold and carbon-based uh, nanowires. Uh, these look interesting, and they look uh, almost like an amphiphilic structure because they are much larger in scale. And I'll, I'll give you one uh, concept that might be of interest, and, and basically an emerging concept in material science. <coughs> so we have these biphasic wires, gold hydrophilic, carbon hydrophobic. And we put this into a solution that contains uh, oil and water, and then shake it up. Essentially, just like amphiphilic molecules self-assemble into micelles, 
these structures, even though they are large, uh, do self-assemble. They are not as perfect an assembly as these smaller molecular scale uh, uh, structures, but certainly they do self-assemble. And they have, you know, in this case, all the gold pointing out and all the carbon are inwards. Uh, and you can actually reverse this assembly and create a black sphere. So it's an interesting concept. Uh, if you can design and make the building blocks, design a building blocks with this multi-component uh, ends, just like chemists make molecules, you know, by design, uh, then, then you have all kinds of interesting possibilities. And even looking further, the question is, can you create structures that would assemble and deassemble, you know, by external stimuli? So some the concept that is very common in biological systems, like reconfigurable uh, assemblies, is that possible if you can design the right kind of building block? <clears throat> in fact, uh, you could put additional components into these wires. For example, here's a nickel uh, piece in, in this segment. <clears throat> and uh, once you have these spheres that assemble from these nanowires, then you can use a magnetic field to move them around. So that was just an example, but I think we can go further and think about what possibilities exist in trying to build these type of uh, structures that could be you know, manipulated, that could be deassembled or reassembled at will. I think that will really change the way we look at nanotechnology. Now, there are also some practical sides of these junction-based nanostructures or you know, hybrid nanostructures. Uh, what we looked at before was the segmented structures, but we could also create uh, coaxial ones, and this is particularly interest interesting for uh, things like three-dimensional electrodes for battery, thin film battery systems. And we have been doing quite a bit of work, and I'm going to show you a few examples. Uh, the basic idea is that if I'm creating a thin film battery, and if I want to increase the energy per footprint, I have to increase the thickness. But if I increase the thickness, basically the lithium diffusion distance increases. So it, the, the whole process becomes inefficient. So the best way to do this would be to create nanowire electrodes with coaxial coating of the electrolytes, uh, you know, conformally. And you can see that the, the, this two, 3D uh, configuration is much better in terms of 2D when you're trying to build something like this. <clears throat> and you can take this concept all the way and demonstrate that you can, in fact, create entire energy storage devices on a nanowire. You know, from the sequential uh, process that I showed you using a template, I can create essentially the whole anode, cathode, electrolyte system all on a single nanowire. So that makes it essentially uh, a fully performing functional battery uh, at, at the nanoscale, you know, single nanowire concept. And again, in the long run, you know, we might be thinking of this differently, how the power is distributed to devices. Uh, if you look at biological systems, rather than the centralized uh, uh, power delivery system that we use in our technologies, most of the things are decentralized. So the question is, can I have energy or power associated with every device that I create? And I think you know, the whole long, uh, longer perspective would be that it's indeed, indeed possible. And of course, you know, when you think about something like battery, you're not thinking about just electrodes and electrolytes separately. It's a whole system. And if you want to get the best efficiency, you have to build all the components into the nanowire system in this 3D, three-dimensional concept. So we have actually done this, uh, again, you know, we have to start with the current collectors and create a nanowire current collectors that are porous, then deposit the electrodes, and then ultimately uh, also you have to choose the right material. So in this particular case, we use uh, uh, silicon as the anode, and you can see that the performance uh, and the capacity that you get is extremely high if you do everything right, you know, all, all the way from the current collectors to the anodes to the electrolytes. Uh, and if, if they are all structured right, then you can get the best out of uh, these materials. <clears throat> now, here is another one uh, example of the use of silicon into this nanowire format. And silicon, uh, as at least whoever is knowledgeable about battery knows that it has severe problems because of uh, uh, the expansion and instability mechanically. So we have to go with this nanowire concept. And the nanowires, again, you know, yeah, if you put the right kind of materials together, in this particular case, silicon, and copper, because these are the current collectors that go all the way into the nanowire system, uh, you can get very intimate contact, and again, you get very high performance uh, for these type of materials. Now, in integrating all these components into a single piece is something that we have been thinking about for a long time. In fact, several years ago, we introduced this concept of uh, essentially a paper battery, uh, which means that you, you integrate all the components like the electrodes and electrolytes into a flexible system, in this case, uh, simply a piece of paper, or cellulose or polymer. Uh, and then, you know, th these would be useful uh, for s specific cases of energy storage. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I want to <coughs> uh, give you 
is something that, uh, uh, I tell you something that is recently been developed in our lab. And this again is a, is a very different concept. The idea uh, of how you can deconvolute the components of a system like a battery and then essentially reintroduce this into any kind of form factor. Uh, and the idea was paintable battery or essentially taking all the electrodes and current collectors and electrolytes and dispersing them into solutions or inks and then simply spray painting them over different surfaces. Uh, and we essentially chose the systems that is already uh, the, uh, commercially available. Uh, but by doing this, it really allows us to do a lot of interesting things. You could uh, spray paint these batteries on any surface, any uh, geometry, uh, essentially any arbitrary form factor or footprint. And, uh, and, and even more interesting would be that the manufacturing process could be completely redesigned because compared to the conventional battery processing technique where different components are made separately and jelly rolled, here you could simply go and spray uh, the, you know, multiple components on any uh, different area that you require. So it was again a paradigm shift in thinking and uh, <coughs> how you could utilize the idea that things could be dispersed and sprayed uh, could lead to a different manufacturing process. <coughs> now, let me talk a little bit about this two-dimensional materials because that was one of the themes of this uh, workshop. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically the graphene has had an impact and it's going to go beyond that, I suppose, now with uh, a lot of the other materials coming into picture. And again, you know, when we talk about engineering, uh, it's very relevant in this uh, realm as well. <coughs> now, uh, we have already seen that we have pretty good control now uh, many groups do this very well, <coughs> large area graphene growth, and this has been supported by a tool development, especially Raman, which allows you to detect how many number of layers you have in these structures, and that has been extremely useful. But one thing to remember is that when you do growth by CVD, and that has still not been uh, you know, optimized uh, in, in some sense. Uh, most of the early experiments on graphene, which resulted in very high values for mobilities and so on, were all done on natural graphite that has been peeled. And those are the best materials. They are the largest domains that you have. So when you start growing materials by CVD, by nucleation and growth process, you end up with grain boundaries. And the question is, can you avoid these grain boundaries? Or can you utilize the grain boundaries in the right way? Uh, it's interesting. I think very few uh, work has been done on looking at transmission through grain boundaries and so on, although some theoretical work show that it could be interesting. But nevertheless, I think we are in this process of trying to figure out how to grow large domains without grain boundaries and defects. But I, you know, from my perspective, <laughs> in addition to all the electronic possibilities, you know, the question is, why is graphene so interesting? Well, from a simple, you know, naive uh, sense, graphene is extremely interesting for me because it's a single atomic layer material. Right? It's transparent. It has got all kinds of, you know, it's a two-dimensional material, so you, I can do top-down approach if I want to pattern these. So from those perspectives, graphene is much more interesting than carbon nanotubes, because nanotubes, the biggest problem, as you saw, was assembling it. You know, putting these things together was a, a real problem. But graphene allows you to do top-down approach, and that's very interesting. And here is an example of what kind of things we could make. Uh, here is simply a graphene layer where, uh, you know, I've taken that and created a gap and put a thin electrolyte layer on top and created a supercapacitor device. And this I could transfer into any other substrate. Uh, and if I'm, you know, thinking about transparent memories or uh, whatever, you know, flexible electronics <coughs> looks for, I could also integrate these kind of structures for power. And that could be also, you know, uh, very much uh, uh, tunable for what you're looking for in flexible electronics. There are also other phenomena that are interesting, which can, has been overlooked in many ways. You know, because graphene is so thin and so transparent, there are other phenomena that also looks very fascinating. Uh, here's some work done from uh, my friend in collaboration at RPI, essentially looking at the behavior uh, of wetting on substrates with and without graphene layers on top of it. And it looks like when the graphene layers are so thin, the wetting phenomenon is almost transparent to this particular coating. Uh, this is fascinating. And, and th this depends on whether the interaction between water and the substrate is governed by short-range interactions or long-range forces. Now, if it is short-range, then this does not work. Uh, because the forces are too strong. But if it is long range, for example, on a metal, the coating of graphene doesn't really affect the wetting angles at all, which is fascinating. Because, first of all, it could be a protective layer for the metal, 
you know, for oxidation and so on, and it will not change the behavior of wetting. So there are applications like boilerplate application that could be really uh, very interesting to pursue. Now, graphene is also a fascinating layer for movement of fluids. Uh, we have already seen in nanotube area that the water transport through nanotube is quite, quite interesting. And here is another uh, experiment that we did in collaboration with a group who has a specific uh, <coughs> tool that would allow you to detect the forces as water slides on, on these surfaces. And what is, again, fascinating is that most of the cases, most of the surfaces, the lateral forces uh, you know, for the water or water droplet or any other droplet to move on a surface essentially depends on what is called a resting time, the, you know, the latent time that it takes uh, to start moving. Uh, and, and this is true for almost all cases, all surfaces, particularly because there seems to be some re molecular reorientation on the surface as the water is actually moving on the surface. But it so happens that in graphene or HOPG, you know, they are so strongly covalently bonded that there is no chance for any molecular reorientation that this is almost invariant with the resting time, the forces that is needed to uh, move away. So the tribology of <coughs> water and other fluids could be quite different on layers like uh, graphene, and those are probably the things that will ultimately end up as being useful, because I can think of graphene being coated on a microfluidic channel, and that would be very different movement possibilities for fluids as it goes through. <coughs> now, you could also think of hybrid structures, and again, that will be the real possible use of some of these materials. Here, you know, it's a beautiful sandwich between these antenna-like structures. This is, again, this is done by uh, Naomi Hala's group, uh, essentially, these uh, uh, you know, gold antennas are sandwiched between two graphene layers. So essentially, the plasmons that are generated are nicely coupled to the graphene layer, which is high conductivity. <coughs> so they act as a very good uh, photo detector. <coughs> and other plasmonic applications are also pursued by them. Uh, we, in fact, collaborate with them, and we provide the materials. <coughs> uh, again, uh, you know, there are various structures that you can make and tune by either uh, the size or the electrical doping uh, in order to change the plasmon uh, dynamics. And the point is that you know, th this kind of structuring is much easier when it comes to graphene compared to other materials like carbon nanotubes, simply because it's a two-dimensional material that allows you to uh, use the techniques that we are most familiar with, which is essentially the uh, patterning top down. Now, carbon is also interesting because carbon has been around for a very long time. It has been extremely useful, practically, activated carbon and things like that. And they're all not just pure carbon. They're all carbon uh, combined with other species. So following, again, the activated carbon approach, people have been looking at uh, oxidized graphene for various things. And I'm not going to go into the details. But again, the structure of this material is quite compli complicated. You know, nobody has really understood until very recently what functional groups are there on the graphene surface when you oxidize them and how these are distributed, and can you control the way they are distributed. I think there, there are fascinating ideas there. Now, we have recently done some experiments where we have actually oxidized it very heavily, so basically putting all these functional groups, and then removing it, and you can see that there is a sequential uh, <coughs> programmable possibility of removing certain functional groups in uh, intervals of time. So you know, the carbonyl goes first, phenol goes uh, second, tertiary alcohol goes in the end. But, but basically, you could essentially oxidize the graphene layer and programmably remove certain functional groups one at a time, which means that you can tune the band gap to some extent of this material. <coughs> Not only that, graphene oxide is quite fascinating. Uh, you know, we have done some experiments where we've shown that the graphene oxide is, in fact, an ionic conductor in the hydrated form. It's a proton conductor. So you could take that graphite oxide, uh, you know, it's a film, and then use uh, a laser beam to scribe it so that it gets reduced. So you have reduced graphene oxide and graphene oxide. So the RGO, or reduced graphene oxide, is the electrode, and GO is an electrolyte, which is an ionic conductor. And you could simply make supercapacitor devices by taking this GO film, simply writing the electrodes uh, of RGO using laser beam. So once again, it's interesting because you know, until recently, people have not really looked into the properties of these oxidized or uh, you know, uh, chemically modified graphene, uh, but it's uh, uh, slowly coming up, and a lot of people are interested in that. I mean, Mauricio already mentioned about nitrogen doping, and what it, it, it gets more and more interesting if you add boron and nitrogen into the lattice. And this is what I, what I want to focus on in the next uh, uh, few minutes. Now, graphene lattice is a, it's an interesting playground, because you can dope them as 
Mauricio mentioned, but also create hybrids by continuously doping them. And especially if you have boron and nitrogen, this goes all the way from graphene, pure carbon to uh, pure boron nitride, which is an isostructural material compared to graphene. This basic phase diagram is something that we have been looking at for quite a while. Um, even during the nanotube days, we were looking at uh, the BCN system. And there's been lots of theoretical predictions, but very little experimental results that shows that these phases could be created. In fact, uh, if you look at the boron nitrogen carbon system, you know, there is a metal, there is a perfect insulator, and there is also a large number of phases that are semiconductors. Uh, conductors. So if I want to create in-plane, you know, single atomic layer devices, all the components, the insulator, metal, and semiconductor are all here, if you can controllably do this. Right? In fact, the BNC system, as, again, as I said, been theoretically predicted, but not really experimentally found. Uh, there were even predictions uh, like C3 and 4, uh, which has, again, been an elusive phase. Uh, one of the reasons why this happens is that if I start to build a BNC system using techniques like uh, CBD, what happens is that instead of a mixing and instead of getting a uniform phase, <coughs> I get the segregated domains. Now, essentially, the boron nitrogen tends to come together and the carbon tends to remain separate. So what I end up is this quilt uh, or this uh, patchwork of boron nitride domains and, and carbon domains. And when we published this paper a couple of years ago, uh, this was the first uh, uh, you know, CBD growth of kind of this hybrid systems with boron nitride and carbon. Essentially, we found that these domains are segregated, you know, nanoscale segregation of these domains, and you never really get to, uh, or at least, unless you have the right kind of window, you never get to this BCN kind of thermodynamic phases. <coughs> but this allows us to do certain things. When we first did the experiment, we created these random domains of BN and carbon, but then we realized that you could possibly create controlled domains you know, it goes back to this idea of engineering at the nanoscale, right? And what we did then was we took, you know, either the boron nitride or graphene, you could essentially start with either, and removed parts of this using etching and patterning, and then we drew the other phase in those gaps that I, uh, you know, left off. Uh, and it so happens that it nicely forms this interface that is atomically sharp, and you can create all kinds of designs, uh, essentially leading to the creation of hybrid atomic layers uh, for the first time. And if you have the right kind of combinations of materials, like boron nitride and carbon in this case, maybe you know, molybdenum sulfide and other uh, chalcogenides in the other, you could create seamless integration of different phases with different electronic properties in a single atomic domain. And that is really the uh, you know, level of engineering that we need to have in order to create you know, totally functional devices on a single atomic layer. And the whole goal would be to create 2D electronics, you know, for whatever use that is, maybe at least for flexible uh, electronics. Uh, one is in a position today from a fabrication perspective or material synthesis point of view to create hybrid structures containing these atomic layers uh, that is contiguously matched. So you can create all kinds of patterns and uh, the smallest you've done is about 100 nanometer features uh, of boron nitride uh, or graphene with a boron nitride matrix. Now, boron nitride itself is a very fascinating material, and people have been using boron nitride as a substrate of choice for graphene devices. If you look at uh, all the recent work, essentially the best performing devices of graphene has been on boron nitride. But boron nitride is not as easy to grow by CVD, not as easy as graphene, especially if you want to grow monolayers. And, that is, and the reason for that is, if you look at the phase diagram of boron nitride, the cubic phase is rather more stable compared to the hexagonal phase just the opposite of graphite. And that creates problems, especially when you're trying to grow very thin layers. Some, so quite a bit of defects and so on. Uh, so they have been trying to figure out you know, the right way to do this. One of the recent ways, which unfortunately I don't have the slides here, was to start with graphene and then convert graphene into boron nitride. And there are certain topochemical reactions that you could use to continuously change carbon into boron nitride. This has been shown in nanotube communities. So they have been successfully actually able to create boron nitride starting with graphene as the, uh, as the basic uh, building block. So this is some characterization of boron nitride. But what I want to show is that boron nitride is even better than graphene for certain applications like oxidation protection. Uh, because carbon is, of course, you know, it burns in air. Uh, but here what we have shown uh, is that metals like nickel or copper uh, and even graphene, if you are protecting it with a thin layer of boron nitride on top, it can withstand temperatures up to 1,000 uh, degrees or above. 
uh, and this is with just very few layers of boronitride. You know, just think about this. Five, a few nanometer layers of boronitride can protect a metal uh, from oxidation at that high temperature. And here's some uh, detailed characterization that shows how the oxidation proceeds and so on. <clears throat> the other possibility that Mauricio alluded to was also the idea that you can now stack up different layers di with different compositions. And now we are really getting into a realm where you can think about materials that never existed before. You know, the fact that you have different exfoliated layers or different layers that you could grow by CBD processes <clears throat> now allows you to think about stacks that are artificial, you know, not like graphite or boronitride, but maybe combined stacking. <clears throat> and uh, here are some experiments that we have been able to show that you could grow boronitride on uh, graphene. Uh, but again, people have had various ways of trying to build this kind of structures. Uh, how do you put these things together, one on top of uh, the other, to create artificially stacked Van der Waals solids? And that has not been really explored, and it might have very interesting properties. Uh, 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 of course, one would be, the ideal case would be if you could create solids through the solution phase, because then you can create bulk. <clears throat> and of course, you can create randomly stacked structures of boronitride and graphene and even other uh, layered materials. But what would be fascinating is some chemistry can uh, figure out a way to controllably stack multiple components uh, or multiple layers of different compositions, one on top of the other, so that you can create or generate solids that has never existed before. So here is an example of a randomly stacked carbon and hexagonal boronitride layers. And again, you can make this in bulk quantities. but. <clears throat> In the long term, we might be able to create uh, ordered stacks as well, which will be very interesting. Uh, we have also been looking at CBD growth of materials like molybdenum sulfide, and you can do large area domains. And as Mauricio pointed out, there are grain boundaries and other defects as well in these materials. Uh, we could dope them. You know, I can grow molybdenum sulfide and then dope them with selen uh, selenium so that I get moly sulfur selenium systems. Uh, we can also grow things like gallium selenide, which is a much larger band gas than uh, these materials. So suddenly we have come to a point where we could grow by simple CVD processes or vapor transport processes large areas of these atomic layers. And that, that, that has been the real impact of graphene in my opinion, that suddenly people have figured out, starting with graphene, how you could really grow large area single atomic layer material. And as Mauricio again pointed out, there are also tools like Raman spectroscopy that might allow us to identify how many layers you have in these materials. You know, you've done this for molybdenum sulfide and maybe uh, others will follow. So I think, you know, from a materials synthesis point of view, it, it's fascinating that suddenly the technology or the knowledge has become available to allow us to build all these layers very, very easily. There are other systems that I don't want to really go into detail, but here is one where we have looked at a hybrid system of vanadium oxide and graphene. And again, this has been processed through uh, uh, solution processing. And you can get these scaffolds that contain ribbons of vanadium oxide that is laced with graphene. And it has served as a very interesting scaffold for electrodes, cathodes for batteries. Uh, and, and essentially for a good cathode material, good electrode material, what you need is a very porous structure, you know, oxides of course has high capacity, but also a conducting layer that goes along with the oxide material. So this hybrid structure of this ribbon with graphene laced on it essentially gives you a pretty high charging and discharging capability for these electrodes. Now, the last point that I want to mention about this, about this 3D materials, the question, the big question is how do I go from building block level to three-dimensional structures? I think that is a holy, real holy grail in, in nanotechnology. If I take the example of carbon nanotubes, there are instances, there are examples where people have shown, including us, that it is possible to join two nanotubes together using topological defects and structures like that. So the, the question is, of course, this was done in an electron microscope, so you have done it on a very local scale. The question is, is such processes, you know, possible uh, as, we, as we try to scale and build larger scale materials? Here is the collaborative work with Mauricio. <coughs> one, one of the students essentially uh, added boron into the CVD process, which allowed these nanotubes to have branches as they grew. So rather than, you know, instead of having these simple arrays of nanotubes or separated nanostructures, what we ended up when we put some catalytic material like boron was that it created these network structures that are essentially three-dimensional. 
So rather than getting powder, you get a solid, which you could simply peel off from the CVD furnace. <coughs> and again, this characterization shows that this boron material is uh, segregated into these junctions, which are of interest. And these are, again, fascinating because you know, they're very super hydrophobic, but also oleophilic. So here is an example where we have used these sponges to remove oil from a contaminated oil water system. And not only that, you could, once you, the sponge absorbs the oil, you could burn off the oil because it's all a graphitic scaffold, and then you can reuse the scaffold again. So if you can possibly make these kind of structures, here is another approach to build these three-dimensional solids. We start off with graphene oxide rather than you know, carbon nanotubes. But it's the same story. You know, the question is, how do we connect these building blocks to build three-dimensional structures? So this is, instead of the CVD process, here you have a chemistry process that essentially allows these GO pieces to be joined together, and one could end up with large solids that contains very porous scaffold that contains these connected graphene oxide systems. So I think there are many approaches that people are following. And again, here again, the CO2 absorption that um, uh, shows that this particular scaffold is reasonably good. But the point I was trying to make is, if you have, you know, if one is, I think it's important to design the right approaches that would allow us to connect these nanostructures to build, um, you know, scaffolds and three-dimensional porous architectures. Of course, it will be even better if you can control these junction formations and create solids that can be tuned in terms of density, properties, and so on. So I think the next generation of nanotechnologies probably is going to look at this in a very important way because building blocks are fine, but any practical application needs larger materials. And the whole idea of nanotechnology was to give you better performance. And if you cannot create the right kind of junctions and build up in a scalable fashion, it's simply you know, a lost cause. So I think we have to focus on this. Here are some other possible architectures that we are also trying to build. Uh, an example of that kind of architecture built by Jim Tool's group, where not only he has placed nanotube arrays between graphene layers, but he claims that he can actually create covalent bonds between the graphene and the nanotube, so that the final properties are much better than when it would be simply just uh, sandwich structures. The last example <coughs> that I want to give is the last um, challenge that I showed in the, you know, uh, in the nanotechnology challenges, essentially interfaces. You know, as I said, the best nanocomposite that you can think of is this conch shell that I showed you. Right? And nature has done this very interestingly. They've taken you know, hydroxyapatite or calcium carbonate and laced it nicely with a polymer layer, which is basically protein in the biological system, and come up with a very, very tough material. Right? And that has been done basically bottom up, you know, you layer by layer deposition you know, the right kind of nanostructuring of the ceramic material and the polymer. And we never do that in the real life. Uh, you know, from a synthetic point of view, composites are always done by mixing two things together. Mixing is a good idea, but when it comes to very small scale, mixing is not very efficient. You know, the best way to create a nanocomposite would be to take a system that has the nanoparticle with the right amount of polymer around it and then put it together. Right? That, that would give me the right kind of composite what basically the nature has done. So it has been a real issue. Uh, and again, you know, early nanotube, uh, when the material was discovered, people were suggesting that this would lead to the best composites that we can have, simply because the stiffness of the nanotube, an individual nanotube, was the highest that you could ever see. Right? But it never really translated to larger materials in terms of properties, simply because you know, what is rate limiting is all these interfaces. Right? If I put nanotubes into polymer material, and I apply a load, the load does not get transferred. It goes across. So there is no effectiveness at all for these nanotubes sitting in the polymer unless it is properly chemically bound. Uh, you know, even the carbon fiber community worked for years and years to create the right kind of uh, interfaces between the polymer material. So nanotube, it's even worse because it's the smoothest fiber that you can think of. And, and in addition to that, these are also short fibers. You know, short fibers are no good in terms of structural reinforcement because load is not carried over long distances. So there's a lot of misconceptions similar to you know, what uh, I think uh, Jeremy was, you, you were saying about the Nobel Prize uh, quote saying that graphene is the strongest material. I think it's, you know, certainly does not make any sense. So I think it's important to really uh, understand these basic ideas uh, you know, and, and try to translate the properties in the right way. And that is not going to be easy at all. <coughs> Uh, 
Of course, there are some other possibilities. You know, there are value-added things always. You know, in, in this particular case, what we are showing is that although the interface between polymer and the nanostructure is not very strong, it can be utilized in other ways. You know, basically, if I put load on this composite that contains nanotubes, essentially applying load does not translate it very well, but it translates into absorption of energy because the interface is slipping all the time, right, because it's so weak. So I could, I could think of this composite for something like a vibrational damping because energy is absorbed when I'm putting load, right? but not for a structural reinforcement. So I think you know, one has to really figure out what is right for the material that we have. And similarly, you know, how do you place, how do you, how do you put nanostructures in the right place? I think that is the question that I was essentially addressing. Right? If I want to make a composite uh, you know, with nanotubes, uh, you know, I'm bent on using nanotubes in my composite, what would be the ideal situation? Well, the ideal situation would be to solve an existing problem. And one existing problem is in 3D composite. You know, typically, you know, in a fiber reinforced composite, all the fibers are running in the, the you know, in plane fashion. So there's nothing in, through thickness. There's no real reinforcement through thickness. So, you know, it's very weak. It delaminates pretty easily. So what can I do? I could place some nanostructures and nanotubes in between these fiber layups so that there is some interaction between them, even van der Waals, you know, that will add some value to this. I can increase thermal conductivity in the through thickness direction. So there are some interesting possibilities that I can do, but not by simply saying that, you know, because single nanotube is so stiff, I can get the best composites out of it. I think that, that's really uh, ignorant speaking. Now, <coughs> this is the last slide that I'm going to show from uh, Rasal's point of view. Basically, what is interesting about nanocomposite is that nanostructures have large surface to volume. Right? So the impact for the same amount of material that I would add into a composite structure is much higher if I use nano instead of micro. Right? So here is an example of that impact playing itself. So we made these nanocomposites with carbon nanotubes and polymers uh, infiltrated in them, and we were doing this compressive dynamic testing. And what was fascinating is that, uh, you know, in, typically if, if I do this on a pure polymer, you know, there's no change at all with number of cycles. But with this composite material, I see an increase in stiffness continuously over a million cycles. Kind of, I mean, it, it was very strange because typically if I load a material dynamically, it should deteriorate or there's no reason why the stiffness should increase. Right? So we looked at it and we did more characterization and it so happens that what is happening when you're dynamically loading these materials is that the interface between the nanotube and the, and the polymer, so it's called an interface. It's actually continuously reconfiguring when I'm doing this dynamic uh, situation. And that is because initially, because the nano structure is so small, much smaller than the, uh, the polymer chain, uh, you know, uh, length. essentially when I make this nano composite, it's not very well formed to start with. So when I'm doing this dynamic loading, what is happening is that this interface is continuously reforming, and that is what we're seeing uh, in this. You know, there's a dynamic reorientation of the structures because the structure is ill-formed at this nanoscale polymer interface. And we have actually recently seen these things happening also in liquid crystals and other materials. So it seems to be a broad concept in any kind of uh, composite structure or dye block uh, polymer structures. So ideas like this, you know, self, it's basically self-stiffening. You know, that, that's fascinating. Can you make materials that are self-stiffening or self-strengthening? Self-strengthening might be a little bit more complicated, but certainly self-stiffening would have very important applications. So I'm going to kind of wind down. Uh, I've already spent some of uh, my time. Uh, it's my group, uh, the constantly changing faces. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge the funding and collaborators. But, but what, what I want to kind of say uh, as a summary is that there is on one side science and then the other side technology. Many times we get confused between you know, taking science to technology and many of the things, uh, most of the media write-ups, the Nobel Prize quote, you know, they're, they're all kind of misleading in many ways because it's not easy to translate science into technology for very many reasons. And you know, there are a lot of interesting, exciting issues in nanomaterials and there are, there are some value-added applications that I can think about right away. But the real revolutionary technology has some intrinsic problems, you know, manufacturing problem, as I said, right, assembly problems, and this intrinsic variability issues. Uh, and in addition to that, all these interfaces, contacts, and so on and so forth. So it's not a technology that is going to suddenly 
come out and say you know, that this is going to be you know, uh, soon uh, in our life, but it's going to take time. And so, as we solve some of these intrinsic problems, I think we will be able to get a better handle of these uh, materials. From a materials point of view, it's fascinating because we're re really working at the frontier of length scales. And, and that is certainly very, very interesting. Uh, and of course, you know, as material scientists, what we all want to do is to be able to have the highest flexibility creating materials that would be more responsive. You know, I don't want to use the term more intelligent because that would be a little bit too much. But essentially, there are a lot of concepts that we could address that has been difficult in a, you know, in a, in a broad sense. Uh, there are concepts that have been existing in biology, things like self-healing, or I mentioned self-strengthening. The fascinating concepts, and I think, you know, as material scientists, especially for young people here, there is these beautiful problems that we can address, and maybe nanostructures provide a good avenue to explore to, uh, in addressing some of these issues. So that, that's basically, uh, you know, what I have to say. And also, you know, think out of the box. You know, certainly our intention is to actually have our paintable battery decorate your rooms and, you know, bathrooms one day. So I think if you can, you know, we have the materials science capability with us. And I think there are very, very interesting problems around that could be uh, addressed from what we can do in terms of material science. Thank you very much.